Keith Pompey, Philly.com, The Inquirer, Daily News. He joins me now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline as his Pitt Panthers are done. The Mountaineers tonight, my friend. How are you? Yeah, don't worry. You don't worry. Y'all will join us after tonight. <laughs> I'm surprised we're here. What an awful season yeah. this has been. Terrible. Yeah, but I can't say anything, Mike. <laughs> I yeah. want to talk trash, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you out. Um, yeah. All right. So we're, we got 14 left here, okay? So have you, mm-hmm. you're around the team on the road, at home, almost every day. Have you formulated an identity of this team yet? Or as Brett Brown, you know, says after almost every game now, we're still cramming. We're still figuring it out. We're still cramming. Have you been able to formulate an opinion or an identity of this roster with 14 games left? You know, it's it's really hard right now just because, you know, Joel Embiid missed eight games and he's only been back for two. You know, um, the the thing is, in a perfect world, and and I think this is going to be close to the identity that, that they have, that everything's going to run through him. You know, he's going to be the guy. You know, um, Tobias Harris, J, um, J.J. Redick is going to get stuff off for dribble handoffs, hit threes. You know, Tobias is going to possibly be the second leading scorer. And, um, you know, Ben's going to do what he does. And Jimmy comes in in the clutch and hits some shots. But I think that it's going to be Joel's team. The only thing is, is, is you know, you would like to see a sample size of it, of what they could do. But right now, you know, it's only been two games since he's been back. But I think in order for them to be successful, everything's going to have to run through him, you know, and and then, you know, everybody gets in where they fit in that, so to speak. But, um, you know, the identity, if you just said, what is it, gun to your head, I have to say it, it's Joel Embiid. Yeah, and I, 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 I was listening to your Locked On podcast this morning, I guess it was, and I thought you guys were making a good point of, you know, they seem like they try to go out of their way to make sure everybody somehow gets involved as opposed to just saying, you're going, let's just keep going through you. But it seems exactly. like it's like, hey, you get three shots. Well, wait a minute. Well, now we need to get Butler a couple of shots. Well, we need to get J.J. his shots. Oh, we got to make sure Joel gets his touches. It seems that they are, there's no flow each night. It just kind of is almost trying to get all five guys happy at once. Exactly. And, and I think and that's part of the problem when you have – you know, a lot of guys, especially with contract years, when you have a lot of guys who, let's face it, outside of J.J. Reddick, you know, they're all um, in the starting lineup. They're all, like, known to be the alpha dog, like be that guy. And J.J. was, you know, throughout college, through, you know, and once he came here, he took a secondary role, talking about the NBA. But it's one of those things where, you know, when we always get on it, we always talk about him, but it's one of those things where Brett Brown, if you're a coach, you know, it's a tough situation just because, you know, you have to keep all four happy. Now, of course, after a game, they're all going to say to us, like, oh, yeah, I'm pleased with my role. But really, it's a role that they've never had to experience in their lives. So I think that's why we see that. That's why we see them get out of rhythm, because they're trying to get force all of them to get their touches and to be happy. Um, and in that case, you know, you, you talk about other teams. And, and it was something that you guys brought up, and I've talked about this a lot on the show, Keith. I can't stand this switching in the NBA all the time. Like, I get it. It's almost a blessing and a curse. It's like I got a six foot ten guy that can guard four different guys, but now it seems that teams are taking advantage of the fact that you're going to be, you know, switching guys, including, hey, I got a seven foot two guy that can guard, you know, a six foot seven guy. That's great, but other teams seem to be using that against the Sixers more so now than it helps. Oh, you're right. I mean, it was funny because, um, excuse me, when they, I remember when they played Toronto, I, I forget exactly the date of the game, but it was when, you know, Toronto had an, you know, all access with, you know, your company ESPN. And the coach, Nick Nurse, said, that's what we're going to do. They like switching. So if they want to switch, we're going to make sure that they switch into a matchup that helps us not them. And they were seeking out players. It was like guys were running around dribbling and next thing you know, you got this dude, go to the basket. You know, it was it was it was crazy and, and they do that a lot again. I get it. That's the NBA. But, you know, 
you can't keep doing it to the detriment of your team when you know that teams are going to seek out certain players. And that's what happens. Teams tend to seek out J.J. Redick when he's on the floor. Sometimes they try to get, you know, they, they'll try to get uh, T.J. McConnell into a mismatch where he's guarding a post player and they'll just post him up. So, you know, that's, that's the one thing that they need to do. And something else that they don't do, it just seems like they do not take advantage on the other end. Like there were times when, when uh, Tobias Harris had the point guard posted up and you would think that they would give him the ball, but they didn't. Guys were looking for their own shot. So, you know, the Sixers need to get rid of that switching. And then when they're on the offensive end, they need, they need to do a better job of taking advantage who, when they get the ideal matchup. Who is that on then? Is that on the individual players on the floor? Is that on their philo- the coaching philosophy that, hey, if you see a mismatch, let's go to it? Or is it, hey, I have the ball in my hand. I want to do something. I don't care that this guy's got the – you know what I mean? Like, is that selfishness or is that just the philosophy? Well, you know, I, I think I think when it comes down to it, I think the players on the floor have to be a little bit more aware. You know, like there could be certain instances where a play is drawn up and, you know, they want to go through that play. But when you see that mismatch, that's an easy bucket. You need to go to it. You know, um, I, you know I, I, I hate to believe that a coach will say, okay, you got Tobias on a six-foot point guard. I want you to hoist this three. Right. You know, don't go down low. So when it comes down to that, you know, it, it's not the coach. I think it's the player. It's one of those things where, you know, the coach is going to draw the play. But when you have, you know, eight, seven, 10, 11 year veterans, they've been playing basketball forever. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's what you do on the court, it's your reaction, it's your instinct, it's your IQ, it's what you see. You take care of that. And I think they need to do a better job of that, you know, when they see these Mitch matches. Keith Pompey here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline uh, covers the Sixers, Philly.com, uh, the Inquirer, the Daily News. Uh, turnovers. This has been a number now. You know, this is a product of how they play, they will say. But it seems that I think you wrote about this, that the turnovers are continuing to be an issue in the six years. You know, it's been a little while that it seems like this team has just not been in. Now, they cut them down by one turnover from last year to this year. But is that still the bugaboo that might catch up to them come playoff time? It is. It is. Because, you know, here's the thing. And, you know, you have certain people that will say, look, man, you know, we're making too much uh, out of these turnovers, right? We're making too much out of the turnovers. You know, they play with p- pace and space. Well, the game was slowed up last year in the playoffs, and they were still turning the ball over. You know, they're doing dribble handoffs, and, you know, by Brett Brown's account, they turned it over six times on dribble handoffs. That's not pace and space. That's like a half-court guy where, you know what I mean, coming around. And that so, dribble handoff between Embiid and J.J., they somehow mess up at least twice a night, it seems. Exactly. So, exactly. So, you know, you look at these turnovers and it's all the same thing. It's either guys trying to force the pass, guys being careless with the basketball, you know, lack of communication, you know. So, you know, and, and I get it. You can always go back and say is our pace. But, no, we're talking about dribble handoffs. We're talking about you're trying to feed the post. We're talking about not paying attention. So, yeah, that's the thing that can catch up. And, unfortunately, you know, when they were tanking and they had Tony Roten, they had um, Brandon Davies, Kendall Marshall, and whomever, you know, it was one of those things where you thought it would get better you know, once the tank was over. Right now, this team has two All-Stars, another guy who's a four-time All-Star, and and Jimmy Butler, and then you have Tobias Harris, who was an All-Star snub, but they turn the ball over just like they did when when they were tanking. So, you know, it's, it's something that's going wrong, guys. Wherever it is, they put on this uniform and they become turnover prone. (laughs) <laughs> no, no question about it. And uh, well, sometimes I do think we forget that you got a 22 year old kid playing point guard, and he's learned how to play that position in this league. And he does tend to turn the ball over by trying to make the perfect play sometimes. Yeah, but you know what? I don't. And and, and you know his turnovers are down this year. And but you know my my thing is, and I'm not attacking Ben Simmons, and I'm not attacking anyone. Um, but you know. 
we look at the Greek freak and we look at other guys, um, they're very young as well, right? And I know they all have flaws, but we have to stop saying that this person is young whenever they make a mistake because, you know, this this isn't the league that, you know, you and I came up in. And, and even with us guys left early, it's, you know, you don't have a lot of three- and four-year college players, and then they go to the league. You know, back then they were 22. You know, Ben Simmons is 22 years old, but he's been collecting the NBA paycheck for three seasons. You know, Joel Embiid, five seasons. You know, he's – you know what I mean? I'm talking about collecting paychecks. So, you know, while they are young, they're not as young in regards to NBA experience as – you know, people would assume in years past. So I think that when we make these excuses, to me, that's a cop out. Now, if it was someone 18 years old and they, you know, was making mistakes, sure. But when you become 22, especially nowadays, you have all stars. Like the guy's 22 years old and he's an all star. You know, I I, I just think that's a cop out. Now. And, and I think he would think that as well. And, again, I'm not talking about you. Yeah. I'm just saying that whenever I hear people say that, I always cringe. Because you look at Tobias Harris. He's been in the league for a long time. He's only 26 years old. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, I just think that's a cop-out when people say that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there is uh, something to be said for the fact that this team has had a lot of roster turnover, uh, and maybe there's a lack of communication there. However... You know, the other night when they're playing the Cavs, I got to ask you, did it be just seem like he just was not interested until the last five minutes when I mean, you were there? What, what, it seemed like he just was on another planet. Yeah, I don't know if it was, you know, because of, I know they had a couple of days off, but for whatever it was, it just seemed like he just didn't have it. Yeah. You know, it, made, it looked like he was a little, his legs were a little heavy. Okay. You know, who knows? But, um, yeah, it just seemed like he I don't know if it was it. more that he just did, like, did he seem disengaged, like his mind was elsewhere, or that he just was, you know, Mark Jackson brought this up on the post game. He said, you know, that first game you got the adrenaline flowing, and then the second game your body hits that, like, man, I'm not in shape right now. Yeah, that's what it looked like to me. It looked okay. like the first game was like, I'm back home, I'm excited. The second game was like, ooh, wow, you know. <laughs> you know. And then not only that, it's Cleveland, um, and, and in addition to that, I think it's, it's more like the first game was like, look, this is my this is my coming back, um, you know, my homecoming, so to speak. It's time for me to get off. The second game, if you notice, he was trying to work on more with the dribble handoffs, you know, trying to see if he could get other people involved. It looked like he was more or less trying to blend in with the teammates in the second game. But in the first game, he was like more of a take charge type of thing. Like, you know, this is my night. In the second game, he needs to do know, more like of that. Said, more of that. More yeah, of that. He needs to do more of that. He needs to do more of that. You're right. Yeah. But the second game in the last what minute, you know, he scored what six points. He had four rebounds, a block. You know, so you know he, you know he, he stepped up when he needed to. Uh, last one for Keith Pompey here. Um, I think uh, Ben Simmons. He seems more comfortable. I don't want to say confident, but comfortable at the line. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that's crazy because, I mean, you know, for a while we were, like, killing him. And it, it's, and now he's shooting 78.1% in the last, uh, you know, six games. And when you factor in that he was shooting 58.5 before that, I mean, that's a huge jump. You know, he just, like you said, I don't know if he's comp more confident, but, you know, more more comfortable. And he, he attributes it to his brother. Now, I will say this. When you go on the road, you always see his brother, like right near the locker room or or on the court before the game, looking at Ben. So they are putting in some effort. You know, what I mean, they're really trying to get this thing together and make sure that you know he can become a solid jump shooter and a solid free throw shooter. You know, in a couple of years in this league. I'm telling you, Keith, we're going to be at a playoff game, and one night he's just going to start popping 15 footers. What's happening? Yeah, he's waiting to pull yeah, it out. He's happen. waiting to pull it out in the playoffs. That's my prediction. Well, when, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm so comfortable if he does it next year. I don't know if he'll do it this year, but next year, maybe we'll see. I could be I could be off on that one. Uh, Keith Pompey, he's at Pompey on Sixers. Sixers tomorrow night, tough one against the Kings. That's a young team that brings it, and uh, they beat the Sixers out there in Sacktown 
earlier, and we'll have that for you live on 97.3 ESPN. I will see you tomorrow, friend. All right, hell to fit, bro. Take care, brother.